into the word a couple people all right a couple people today uh, we are continuing our moving forward series that we started a couple weeks ago really focusing in and, and helping us refocus on on really what we're called to do as a church and we were so hung up on on seeing not one in need that we almost let that be a little bit of a distraction for us as a church and and we really felt moving forward that we need to refocus and and focus on what our mission truly is and it's great to see not one in need but if all we ever do is give away free stuff if all we ever do is kind of meet needs needs, then we're actually making it really comfortable for people on the road to hell. That's, in reality, that's all we're doing. And so we wanted to refocus and understand that we are, our, our, our sole purpose is we want to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Christ. And in doing that, when we do that, then we can begin to see them trained up and see not one in need. But we, we, we were focusing on that and, uh, We've been camping out in the book of Acts, kind of where it all began, where the church began, this movement of people called the church where it was birthed. Uh, and uh, maybe it's only me, but maybe you've noticed this as well, that in, in our world today and even in the church today, we are seeing this kind of politically correct kind of thing spill over into everything that we do. And, and you see it even now, even more so in the church, that people say things like this, well, you know what, I, I, I want to share my faith or I want to talk about Jesus, but you know what, I really don't want to offend anybody. I really don't want to offend anybody. I, I really don't want to speak too boldly about my faith because I don't really want to turn people off. And one of the most common mindsets that has invaded the church today is this. You know what? I'm not going to speak about Jesus. I'll just let my life reflect Jesus. I'll just let my life reflect Jesus and that's good enough and, and I'll just let my, my actions kind of uh, reflect who Jesus is and Sounds good, right? And quite honestly, that's an amazing place to start. How many know that our actions should reflect the God that we serve? That our actions, people should be able to look at our life and by the way we carry ourselves and say there's something different about them. But that is no substitute for us sharing our faith. That is a very important thing that you and I as the church, we are called to share boldly about the God that we serve. We are actually called to preach and declare the good news to everybody, everywhere. Not just kind of go out and say, well, I'll just let my light shine and that's going to be good enough. And why do I say that? Because check out what it says in Romans chapter 10, verse 14. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of, of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without somebody preaching to them? How can they hear without somebody telling them? How can they know the truth if somebody is not going to tell them? And I, hey, I'm all for letting my light shine, but here's the deal. What, what, what it comes down to when we're looking at boldness and the church in boldness, and I think one of the reasons why we can be so bold is that boldness is actually a behavior that is born out of our belief. And then, and then when our belief is in a God who is pretty amazing, right, who created the universe, who spoke it into existence, who loves you and I, who has a plan and a purpose, we can begin to speak boldly. God doesn't need us to kind of protect him and to back him up, but because of who he is, we can speak boldly. See, we speak boldly about what we believe deeply. That's what it comes down to, that we speak boldly of what we believe deeply. And in the book of Acts... Countless times. There's so many verses about this New Testament church, this New Testament group of people who believe so boldly that, that Christ was not dead, that he, was, that he rose again and that he was alive. And because of that, they were willing to speak boldly into situations and circumstances. Acts chapter 9, verse 28. So Saul moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. Acts 14, 3. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there doing what? Speaking boldly for the Lord in Acts 4 31 and and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God say it with me boldly so we're going to talk this morning about speaking boldly 
We're going to talk this morning about speaking boldly, about you and I understanding and knowing the God we serve and being able to speak in a, a lost and hurting and broken culture that so desperately needs truth. So uh, it's not about anymore letting our, our light shine, but maybe in this next season that we begin to speak boldly. Not rudely, not arrogantly, but boldly of who God is and what he's done for us. And we're going to continue the book of Acts and where we left off last week. We looked at uh, Peter and John and what happened to them. They're on their way to the temple. And they passed this lame guy, and they looked at him and said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. How many of that's bold? Right? How, that's pretty bold to reach out and grab a lame man and pull him up by the feet, uh, pull him up by the hand, and he's standing on his feet. That's bold. This freaks everyone out. The temple guard, they're upset. The Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, the religious people, they say, we, we, we got to stop this. And so they bring him in, and they, they kind of put them in this kangaroo court, and they put them in the center and encircle them. And, uh, and and Peter, I love it, man, he just speaks so boldly, and he points his finger at them, and he goes, make no mistake about it, Jesus is the one who raised this guy up, the one whom you crucified, the one whom you killed. And that's a pretty bold move, because they had the power to kill him, to stone him, to, to do away with him, but he, he believed so deeply that he could speak so boldly because he had encountered a God. And so as the story unfolds, now these guys are getting, what are we going to do? What are we going to do with these people and, and what they're doing? And they actually say this in Acts chapter 4, verse 16. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they have done an outstanding miracle. We can't deny it. How are we going to cover this up? How are we going to hide this? How are we going to stop other people from, from talking about this? Uh, that we don't believe it, but man, we can't deny it. We cannot deny what is going on here. I remember when I was diagnosed with cancer and actually given a year to live uh, and, and started a pretty aggressive form of treatment. So I did all the treatment necessary. And then the, the one thing that I wasn't able to do was a bone marrow transplant because there was actually no donor for me. Of the 7 million bone marrow donors in the world, there, I did not have a match. And so they, they said, listen, Rob, you can't get sick. The chances are you're not gonna last a year. You need this. I said, guys, listen, I, I, I trust God. They told me I was never gonna have kids again. And I remember... After about uh, uh, some follow-up appointments, and, and lo and behold, my wife got pregnant. And so I thought, this is going to be amazing news to tell the doctor. And I remember sitting in, I had a, a hematologist appointment with my doctor, and we were just kind of sitting there, and she said, how are things going? I said, great, my wife's pregnant. Didn't even phase her. I was like, she's like stone cold, heartless. I was like, well, maybe this is not a big deal. Maybe this is not big news. I thought this was incredible, amazing. And then halfway through the appointment, she's like. Did you say your wife's pregnant? I said, yeah. She's like, how did this happen? I was like, well, surely you're a doc. She's like, uh, surely you're a doc. You know, she goes, no, Rob, this is impossible. It's impossible for you to have kids right now, let alone after chemotherapy. You got a 99.999% chance you won't have kids. But two years after, but like during your chemo, you can't have kids. It's medically impossible. She just like, we don't know what's up with you. We don't know what's up with you, but whatever you're doing, keep doing it. See, there's something that happens when you encounter Jesus. When people look at your life, they, they may not believe it. They, 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 they can't comprehend it, but they can't deny it. The doctors looked at me and said, this should not be happening. But it is. We can't deny that, it, that it's not happening. There's a child in your wife's belly. So, man, we don't get it. I'm telling you, man, you're going to be able to speak so boldly in your marriage. People, are gonna, people who have written off your marriage, people who have written off your kids. Maybe you're, you're, you're kind of struggling addict and people are looking at you. There's no hope. And all of a sudden, you're going to encounter a God who loves you, has a plan and a purpose for you. He radically changed changes your life and people are going to say, I don't believe it, I, 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 but I can't explain it, but I can't deny it. There is change happening and we are going to have an opportunity to speak so boldly. But the reality is when God does something in our heart, what do we do? I don't want to offend anybody. 
I don't really want to offend anybody, so I'm just going to remain silent. And what happens every now and then we get around those religious people and uh, they start to try to question things and then they're saying, we gotta do something about this. You, you can't go on doing this. And, and, and we see this as it con, kind of continues with, with Peter and John and in verses 17 to 20. It says, but to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. And then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. We cannot help. In other words, guys, we believe so deeply that we are going to speak so boldly. And when you look at those words in the, in the Greek that those words is cannot help, it basically means this. It's impossible. What you're asking us to do is impossible. We cannot even comprehend not sharing and not speaking us. And so, tell you what, you can beat us, we're going to speak louder. You can threaten to kill us, we're going to speak louder. You can threaten to put us in jail, but we are going to speak louder because we've seen and we've heard, we've encountered a God, a Jesus who loves us and cares for us, and it doesn't matter what you threaten me with, I can't help but declare and praise and talk about my God. If you saw what I saw, if you've experienced what I've experienced, man, I walked on water. Can you imagine Peter saying, I walked on water? No, you didn't. Yeah, I did. I stepped out on the water and I walked. I'm telling you, man, when you believe so deeply, you can speak so boldly. The miracles, the signs, the wonders, the feeding of the 5,000. I'm sorry, guys. I, I got a whole lot I got I, I to gotta say. And there's a whole lot of people out there that need to hear it. So I'm not going to stop talking about this guy named Jesus. I'm not going to stop talking about a God who has a plan and a purpose for your life. And, and the reason why I, I think I want to challenge us this morning, and I, I, first and foremost, and a lot of us would say, well, but Rob, that's just not me. I, I just don't get excited like that. I'm like, yeah, you do. Yeah, everybody gets excited about something. You know why I know? Because if you go to a good restaurant, you're going to tell people about it. Yeah. Right? You, you, you see a good, good movie, you're going to tell people about it, and you're going to tell them passionately about it. You read a good article, you're going to tell people about it. You listen to some good music, you're going to tell people about it. Why not our faith? Amen. Why is it when it comes to Jesus, it's like crickets? <laughs> Oh, I don't want to offend. I don't want to. We are called to be a witness. Yeah. When you look at what happened on the day of Pentecost, you will receive power to be my witnesses. And what does a witness do? They testify to what they've seen and to what they've heard. That's it. It's not my job to try to convince anybody. All I am is a witness. I'm going to testify to what I've seen and to what I've heard. So what I want to do for the next little bit here with all of us together, I want to look at some areas that you and I need to begin to speak boldly to, speak boldly into in, in moving forward. And, and some of these are pretty simple. How many like simple? Yeah. Me too. I like simple. I'm a meat and potatoes guy. I, I like simple. One thing I love about God's word is it's pretty simple. And, but we need to begin to speak boldly because we believe so deeply. And when you believe so deeply, you can't help but to speak boldly. And the first thing sometimes you gotta do is you gotta learn how to speak boldly to yourself. You're like, oh great, is this a self-help seminar, right? No, no, I'm you need to speak boldly to yourself. There's times when you need to preach to yourself. Amen. When you're struggling, when you're suffering, because you're not always gonna have this. And is that in the Bible? I'm glad you asked. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse six. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke about stoning him, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He said, hey, I need to, uh, I'm feeling down right now. It's not looking good for me right now. So he began to encourage himself in the Lord. He began to speak boldly to himself. Some of you are saying, well, I'm not, I'm not a preacher. I'm telling you, you're going to preach some of your best sermons ever to yourself. You're going to preach your best sermons to yourself. I remember, man, when I was kind of, when God kind of called me to this and thinking, because I used to be deathly afraid to speak in front of people, deathly. 
deathly afraid. And uh, I remember one time when they, they wanted me to start hosting and, and, and doing announcements. I remember the first time I got up there and, and, and my eyes were closed and I opened my eyes and I looked at all the people and I started to cry. And people thought, oh, God's just blessing him. No, I was afraid. <laughs> I was really afraid. I was like, oh my goodness. And, and, but well, you know what I started to do? I started to preach to myself. Every time I would prepare my sermon and I would stand in front of a mirror and I would preach to myself. And I would preach hard to myself. And sometimes I would preach so good to myself, I would give myself an offering. I'm like, that's really good. Man, that's really good. At the end of my preaching, I got down on my knees. I got saved. I'm like, that is some, some good preaching. But what do I mean when I talk about preaching to yourself? Sometimes you're going to have to look when you're struggling and when you're hurting and say, hey, man, uh, my mind is all messed up. You know what? Uh, I'm going to renew my mind. God, I'm going to renew my mind with the reading of your word. Help me to renew my mind with the reading reading of your word. You you got a lust problem. God, help me to make a covenant with my eyes. Just the way that Job did. I make a covenant with my eyes that I'm not going to sin against you. Uh, Overwhelmed? When you feel overwhelmed, you got to look at yourself and no, no, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. When you start to be afraid, you look in that mirror and you say, God's not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind, so I don't need to be afraid. I'm going to stand on the truth of God's word. You start to feel anxious. Whoa, I don't have to be anxious about everything, but I'm going to begin to pray about everything. God, I'm just so thankful. What happens? You speak boldly about what you believe deeply. It doesn't mean that you're weak. It doesn't mean it just is the reality is sometimes we struggle. Sometimes we go through those moments. God, where are you? God, I need you. And we need to declare God's word to ourselves at times boldly. I love what it says. I've hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so when I start to battle temptation, when I start to feel myself slipping, I look in the mirror and say, "Uh uh-uh, I'm going to preach to myself. I'm going to declare to myself. I'm going to speak boldly God's word to myself. And that's an important thing for you to do. And you know what? I'm not talking about if you've watched Saturday Night Live and doing personal affirmation and like, you're good enough, you're smart enough, and doggone it, people like you. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm I'm not talking about that self-help guru. I'm talking about God's word, declaring it to yourself, declaring it to your situations, to your workplace, to your kids, over your family, over your marriage. You were saying, "Uh uh-uh, no weapon formed against me and my family and my marriage and my kids and my job is going to prosper because I know who I am in Christ. I am the head. I'm not the tail. I'm above and I'm not beneath. God, you are with me. Boldly, speak boldly to yourself. You know what? Another area we got to begin to do this is we got to boldly encourage one another. Here's the reality of the church. We've been really good at correcting one another, right? We're, we're really good at pointing out one another's faults, but man, can we encourage one another? Can you imagine if that was our heart and our goal? Again, Rob, is that in the scripture, Hebrews 3.13, but encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today. So that means today, you know what you're to do? Encourage one another. We're called to speak boldly to one another, to boldly encourage one another. And I love it when I get around people, when I say, how's your day? Whoa, man, I just, I'm struggling. Oh, don't give up, man. There's more in you. Don't give up, man. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your kids. There's more in you. Don't give up on battling that addiction, man. There's strength. I'm telling you, man, what wouldn't it be great if before you could even leave here today that God's going to put somebody in your sights and you're going to go and you're going to encourage the socks off them. You're going to encourage them and and they're, they're going to need exactly what you have to say because that's how God works. This is a body that we are together. This is not just kind of a, a gathering of people to, to fill their time on Sunday, but we are the church. It, it is living. It is breathing. It is active and we need one another. We need to encourage one another. Amen. We need to encourage one another boldly. And, and when you begin to, I'm telling you, man, it's the most amazing feeling when you begin to lift somebody up and you see their whole countenance change. When you begin to boldly encourage them and, and, and all of a sudden they're realizing, you know what, I could do this. I can do this. Yeah, it's about speaking boldly to ourselves. It's about speaking boldly and encouraging one another. Here's one that you're not gonna like, but we need to talk about it. That sometimes we need to boldly but lovingly lovingly correct one another. Let me get that straight. Boldly but lovingly correct one another. 
And that's where we kind of get it wrong, I find, so often. Notice I said lovingly, that is important. It's not about going out and being a jerk in the name of Jesus, right? The church has done a pretty good job at that. The, pretty, the church has done a pretty good job at saying, hey, listen, I'm standing on this biblical moral authority and you need to listen to me. Wife, you need to submit to me. I'm the man. And you begin to take the Bible and dice up your wife. I'm telling you, that's not, that's not biblical authority. That's abuse. That's spiritual abuse. We are called to, to lovingly correct that when we see a brother or a sister getting off path, when we see them stepping outside of God's plans and purposes, that we come alongside them lovingly like it says in Matthew 18 and we go to them and we say, hey, what's going on? This is what I've noticed. How can I pray with you? And then you kind of open up that door. It's not like, oh my goodness, did you see what so-and-so was doing? Because the church is pretty good at that, right? We're pretty good at pointing out faults, but we actually, I think, suck at going to people and lovingly correct them. And we've not done a very good job. Some of you are brilliant at it, and I know that, and I'm getting better at it, but I have no problem engaging and stepping in when I see a husband disrespecting his wife or a wife disrespecting their husband. I have no problem when I see an addict getting off path to, to go to them. I have no problem stepping in when I see a single guy kind of sleeping around and I'm saying, hey, we need to address this. Can I tell you, there's, I don't think any form of confrontation or lovingly correcting has a happy beginning. Because it's hard. It's hard to step into those moments. It's hard to, to do it in a lovingly way. But this is what I know. Proverbs 27 verse 6 says this. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. Right? Wounds from a friend can be trusted. That if we trust one another in this family, in this thing called church that we're getting to, to live out every single day, if we trust one another, that I, when somebody comes to me, I'm going to trust them enough that, hey, maybe they see something that I don't. Maybe they see, maybe I've gotten off track somewhere. Maybe it's been with my language. Maybe it's been with uh, how I'm engaging with people. I don't know. But I'm going to be open to listen. I'm going to be open to listen. And, and imagine if we did that, if we lovingly began to approach people. Because I'll be, I'll be honest, I don't think there's many of us. Some of you, it is, you were just born to confront people. You're just like a bulldozer. You're like, okay, come on, bring it on, right? A lot of us, that's not us. It, we're, we're not confrontational people. So that this is kind of a, a, a confrontational moment. And we can allow the enemy to wreak havoc with it. But if we're going to approach it like Matthew 18, and we're going to approach it biblically and understand that, hey, we've got our best interest at heart, then I'm going to be a lot more open to listen. In so, instead of somebody pointing and saying, you're horrible, you're evil, I can't believe you're doing that. Uh -uh. No, no, that, that we, I'm going to be more receptive when, when I see them doing it this way. So it's about sometimes speaking boldly to ourselves. It, it, it's, it's about speaking boldly to encourage one another. It's about at times stepping into those moments and boldly and lovingly confronting and correcting one another. And this is the most important one most important one, that, that we need to speak boldly about leading people towards Jesus because that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. It's about us declaring the good news of the gospel every day, everywhere we go. And I always get this. If you've noticed, if you've been coming to this church, you'll notice every single service we give people the opportunity to respond to the gospel. Why? Because it's what matters. It doesn't matter if I preach a good sermon and people like it and they're like, that was really good. Hey, did people encounter Jesus? Because that's what it's all about. We want to give people an opportunity every single week to encounter Jesus. And why do I do that? Because when I was 16, guess what? I sat in a service and somebody gave me the opportunity to encounter Jesus and it changed my life. It changed my life that one moment when I prayed a prayer. I had no idea what I was praying. But as soon as I prayed, I'm like, something happened. I can't quite explain it. I didn't get goosebumps. The heavens didn't part. I didn't hear the hallelujah chorus. All I noticed is something changed on the inside. And I said, God, if you're real, I'm willing to give this a shot. 
in that one moment because somebody was bold enough to give me an opportunity to respond to Jesus. I said, every opportunity I have, I'm gonna give people an opportunity to respond to Jesus. Why? Because it affected me, because it, 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 it radically changed my life. It radically changed my life, and, and we are called to testify. We are called to be a witness. When I tell you what God has done for me, if I was to walk you through every single highlight of how Jesus has been faithful and how he's been there through the thick and thin, I'm telling you, you could not help but get saved. With just my whole cancer journey, I'm not just going to let my life that I'm going to declare my life scripture. This is what I live every single day. I quote it to myself every single day. I look in the mirror and I say it, and then I look this way and I say it, then I'm gonna live it. Psalm 118 verse 17 says this, I will not die but live and proclaim what the Lord has done. I gotta tell people about them. I gotta tell people about what God has done in my life. Why? Because it is good news. It is great news. I'm telling you, there are people who are lost and dying, and if we don't tell them, they might go to a Christless eternity. Imagine that. Imagine somebody you work with. Imagine somebody in your neighborhood because you decided you had your Jesus bumper sticker and Jesus saves on your bumper sticker and you kept your lawn perfect and you let your light shine, but you never told them that they could stand before God and say, man, I wish somebody would have told me. I wish somebody would have told me. I think the church has, hey, it's great inside these walls. When we come in a building, we can yell and we can scream. We can worship. Then we go inside. Gotta be, gotta, gotta be good. Can't really offend anybody. Let me just help you out here. Let me just help you out. The gospel, it's offensive. It's offensive. When I read it, I'm like, oh, and I've been living this. It's offensive. It's going to challenge people. When you speak boldly, there's going to be people that don't like it. There's going to be people that ridicule you. There's going to be people that laugh at you and mock you. But you know what? It's too good not to share. It's too good not to share. The reality is, maybe if you're not speaking boldly, it's your belief system is pretty shallow. Right? Maybe that's the reason that, that we don't speak boldly because, well, this is kind of shallow. And why do I say that? Because I've been around the church for a long time and I'm seeing some very passionate conversations about things that have really no weight. And we get so passionate about them. I picked on the flat earthers on, on Thursday, so I'll do it again. <laughs> There's some people you're so passionate about trying to convince people that the earth is flat, but when it comes to Jesus, you're silent. Oh, but you'll go, you'll go toe to toe with anybody and saying this and this and this, but people are lost. And, and when somebody stands before God, they're not going to say, well, uh, I believe the earth is flat. Does that get me in? Right? Does, does that give me some credibility here? No. Guys, I think we're missing it. I really do think we're missing it. We get so caught up in conspiracy theories. We get so, so caught up in things that in the reality have no meaning. Earth is round. It's flat. Who cares? Jesus died on a cross to save me. He died on a cross to save me, and that's what's going to give me eternal life. Hey, did NASA fake the moon landing? Who cares? Who really cares? Because it has no outcome of who Jesus is. It doesn't change what he did or what he, what he has done and what he wants to do with my life. We need Jesus. And if you were as, just as passionate about sharing Christ, I'm telling you, man, it would be amazing. But reality, why some of us don't speak boldly is because we probably don't believe deeply. That really, this is a religious routine. It's a check the box thing. It's like, hey, I've done my, my duty. But when you have encountered, when you have truly encountered Jesus, when he has radically changed your life, when he has saved 
you. You can't shut up about it. You can't shut up about it. Why? Because you were on a road to destruction and Jesus radically saved you and transformed your life. And he set your feet on the solid rock. And now that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and eternity is stamped in your vision, it changes everything and you can't help but talking about that. The reality is, maybe we don't believe that so deeply. And my prayer is that with today, that there's a, uh, an excitement that's ignited in your heart. And, and maybe it's time to take that lampshade off and say, well, you know what? I'm done just letting my life demonstrate, but now I want my words. I want my words to point people to Jesus. I'm going to testify to what I've seen and to what I've heard because God has done something incredible in my life and I need to tell somebody about it. I need to tell my neighbor. I need to tell my, my kids. I need to tell my coworkers. I need to tell the person at the Starbucks or the person at the Tim Hortons or the person at the gas station when I'm pumping gas. I'm telling you, one of the reasons I love Ski Patrol is, and here's a, here's a great thing, easy, easy for me uh, when, when I'm on the chairlift. I always want to, how do I get the conversation to Jesus? And when I'm on skiing, I'm thinking, well, great. I've got a four and a half minute chair ride up to the top. And this is how it usually starts. Hey, how you doing? Good. What do you do for a living? They're like, well, I do this. And then usually they ask, what about you? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> and then by that time, I still got like three minutes and 45 seconds to share Jesus with them. This year, it's just amazing. And so I just can't help but sharing the truth of who Jesus is. Why? Because it's something I believe so deeply that I can speak so boldly. That I can speak so boldly. And we got to let our life be a witness. But there comes a point, how are they going to know if nobody tells them, if nobody preaches to them? How are they going to know? How are they going to know? How are they going to hear? And I believe God has called us, the church, for such a time as this, to step in and be a voice that's going to speak boldly about what we believe deeply. I'm telling you, as we begin to do that, there's not going to be a building big enough to hold the church. There's not going to be a building big enough to hold the church. You're going to be like, Rob, I can't help it. I'm going to the gas station, and people are falling on their knees, and they're, and they're getting saved. I'm, I'm going into Tim Hortons, and you know it's a miracle when someone gets saved at Tim Hortons. I, I just can't believe it. That God is moving because you're just speaking boldly about what you believe deeply. When you testify to what you've seen and to what you've heard, when you begin to declare about how good Jesus is, that is the news our world needs to hear. That's the news that our world is dying to hear. They need truth. They need hope. They need Jesus. Go into all the world and declare and preach the good news to everybody everywhere. Go and testify to what you've seen and to what you heard. We believe so deeply that we're going to speak so boldly. Why don't you stand with me and let's pray. Again, my heart today is that do away with any condemnation because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You begin to hear a message like this and you think, I'm, I don't do that, so I'm horrible. And that's what the enemy will try to get you to believe. But for all of us, hey, we're a work in progress. And I, I don't always get this right all the time. There's moments that I miss when I feel that I can step in and be bold, but maybe fear, maybe doubt kind of sets in. And, and I miss those moments. I'm not perfect. But what I understand is no longer am I trying to convince people. And when you get that out of your mind, that, that it's not your job to try to convince anybody, it's not your job to try to save anybody, you can't do that, you're not that good. It's your job to testify to what you've seen and to what you've heard. That's it. You testify to what you've seen and what you've heard. You begin to tell people what Jesus has done for you. They can't argue with that. They can't debate that because it happened to you. Hey, we can't deny this. We can't deny this. And what did they say? They realized that these guys were uneducated, had no knowledge in the scriptures, but 
they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus, and that changed everything. When we gather in a place like this, it's about being with Jesus. When we gather at home and, and, and we get into our word, it's about being with Jesus. It's about getting that in us so that when we can go out and we can believe so deeply that now I can speak so boldly because I know who God is because he's done it for me. And if he did it for me, guess what? He can do it for you. Oh, come on, church. Now's the time more than ever for us not to shy away but to step into those moments and speak boldly God's truth, his love, his mercy, his grace, his hope, his redemption, his saving power. That's what we're called to do. Father, God, I pray for every single one of us in this group of people. God, that we would have this incredible God, we would have this moment where your resurrection becomes so real to us. God, that we understand that not only did you die, but you rose again. God, that we are gonna step into moments like a Peter and John so boldly declaring your truth and your hope and testifying to what we've seen and to what we've heard. That God, because there is an empty tomb, we can begin to speak so boldly. God, I pray that you would stir Stir us at the core of who we are. God, not that we're not going to be oddballs and we're not going to be weird and freaky, but we're just going to have this assurance. We're just going to know, God, because of what we've encountered, because of what we've seen and what we've heard, that we're going to be full of your love. We're going to be bold with your grace, with your mercy, with your generosity, with your compassion. God, that we're going to step into those moments and earn the right to be heard. God, I thank you for every single person in this room today, those that are watching online. God, I pray our heart is to know you, to know you more intimately. Because we talked about it last week that the boldness is not the goal. Knowing you is the goal. Knowing you is the goal, and when we know you, we can't help but be bold. So God, let us have a, a fresh revelation of your love, of your mercy, of your grace for our lives that we gotta tell other people about it, that we gotta share it with others, to those that are hurting and broken, to those whose marriages are falling apart. God, that we can be a voice of hope. We can be a voice of redemption. We can be a voice of freedom because of who you are. God, help us to speak boldly about what we believe so deeply. That no longer are we gonna shy away from those moments. But God, when we see them, we're gonna do just what your word says, that the righteous are as bold as a lion. That we're gonna step into those moments and we're going to see you invade people's hearts and lives. We're gonna see you save people. We're gonna see you redeem people. We're gonna see you set addicts free. We're gonna see you heal sick bodies. We're gonna see you raise people that have been lame for 40 years, God, at one word. Because we're willing to speak boldly, we're gonna see signs, wonders, and miracles that are gonna point people to you. God, help us to be so bold. Help us to be so bold. Maybe you're here today and you've never said yes to Jesus and maybe you were invited to church and this is your first time or you've been following and you've been on a journey because all of us were on a journey. Some of us, we've come to that place where we've discovered that our lives are empty without Christ and, and we made that choice to say yes to him. We've come to the realization that, hey, like I did when I was 16 years old, when I heard the gospel, I realized I'm pretty messed up. Even though I think my life was together and, and, and I was a talented athlete and had a lot of things going for me, but I realized I'm just a sinner. I'm a sinner that needed forgiveness and I'm a sinner that, that needed hope. And that only hope was Jesus. It wasn't going to be in how, how high I can climb the level in football. It wasn't going to be what kind of job I would get or who I would marry. But I realized at a young age, and I'm thankful I realized at a young age, that I needed Jesus. And 
that moment at 16 years old when I said yes to him, it changed everything for me. It changed everything for me. And some of you, maybe you're here and you're not 16, but maybe you're 40, 50. You've been searching, you've been wondering and you're empty and you're void and you're saying, man, something is missing. And that something is Jesus, period. Every single one of us need Jesus. We were created to be in a relationship with Jesus. And until we do that, there's a void in our life that we will try and search endlessly to fill. We'll fill with stuff. We'll fill with relationships. We think it's gonna be more money or a better job or nicer house or this relationship or that relationship or this substance or that substance. And in the end, it just leaves us empty. You need Jesus. And this morning is an opportunity for you, and I believe God orchestrated that you would be here, you'd be watching, you'd be listening because you're ready. And all it simply is is acknowledging that, hey, I can't do this on my own. That yes, I am a sinner. Yes, I need forgiveness. And Jesus, not only did you come and be, pay the price for my sin, but you rose again. And because of that resurrection, I now have this amazing life. So Jesus, I make the choice to surrender to you today. I'm gonna to ask you to bow your heads online, wherever you're in your living room, or wherever, your kitchen, your bedroom, wherever you're watching. I would say if you're here today, if you're watching online, you'd say, Rob, I need Jesus. Can you pray with me? I'm gonna ask you to be brave and bold and just slip up your hand. Nobody else looking, if there's anybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your honesty. I appreciate that. We're all gonna pray together because we do this every week and we're family. But my, my heart is that you will realize it's not just about saying a prayer, it's to understand that you get to live this prayer now. That you live this, that your life in this next moment is radically going to change forever. That God is gonna take you out of your muck and your mire and he's gonna put you on a solid foundation that you're gonna be his, you're part of God's family, and you get to walk out this incredible plan and purpose that he has for your life. So let's all pray this, say, Heavenly Father, save me from my sins. Would you be Lord of my life? Fill me with your spirit so I could serve you always. Today, would you help me to believe so deeply that I'm gonna speak so boldly that Jesus is my Savior, that He is my Lord. And today, my life is no longer my own. I give it to Him. In your wonderful name, I pray. And everybody said, Amen. Well, bless you guys. Have yourself an amazing week. Go and speak boldly. Just a reminder, if you would like prayer for